This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. Good evening. You are on Joy 94.9 World AIDS Day Worldwide. You are here with Katie, uh, Katie Larson and I'm joined in the studio by Susan Paxton. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Susan. Good evening. We're going to be having a great evening this evening. We're talking about Stepping Up the Pace, which is the conference theme. Um, and we're going to be talking about women and girls. And I'm very, very excited that we are going to be joined by a couple of wonderful guests. So of course, Susan in the studio with me. And then we'll also be speaking to Kim Davis. Um, so Kim, are you there? Are you there with us this evening? I am. Wonderful. Okay, now as uh, uh, with everything else, if this, as part of this broadcast, if you do have any questions, please email on air at joy.org.au or you can tweet hash using the hashtag joywad. All right, so we're going to be talking women and girls for the next hour and uh, talking about the range of issues um, that, uh, that affect, different kinds of issues that affect women and girls in talking about HIV and AIDS. Um, we, one of the first things I really wanted to think about was where you both have come from in terms of your journeys to be talking about this today. So, Susan, you are a, uh, you've lived with HIV for 25 years. And you are now uh, representing the International Committee for Women as part of the conference, AIDS 2014. Uh, you also do a lot of consulting and speaking and basically advocating for women with HIV and AIDS. Is, is, is that right? Is that sort yeah, of capture yeah. what, what your role is? Sure. <laughs> and, um, and Kim, you are also a, a woman that has been living with HIV for about 20 years um, and is now uh, you're leading a, a campaign called Positively Fabulous, which I think is perfectly titled and is basically about a community health arts collaboration between globally aware and change media that's connecting women with li living with HIV with global stakeholders and communities as, and that's that's a project you're working on at the moment isn't it yep that's right fantastic okay well I thought what we'd do is is to just lead off the discussion just have a think about where women are placed in in terms of HIV and AIDS globally um so 17, 17 million, over 17 million women living with HIV. Uh, some, each minute one young woman is infected with HIV. And 49% of women, um, sorry, women represent 49% of all adults living with HIV. So it's pretty, pretty considerable, <laughs> in fact, even proportion there, which might be, I suppose, surprising to some people. Is there a recognition of that in the discussion around HIV and AIDS outside of the most fully informed circles, Susan? Um, I think actually women living with HIV constitute now 54% okay. of, of all people living with HIV. I mean, women are physiologically more vul vulnerable as well as, you know, for all the you know, patriarchal um, socioeconomic issues around women. Um, I think in our region at the moment, there's this really big push to make sure that we do prevention amongst key affected populations, which is drug users, um, men who have sex with men, um, uh, transgenders and uh, sex workers. A and I think there is a chance that women can get dropped off the agenda. Mm. Uh, and in this country particularly, where women co constitute a very small percentage, I mean less than 20% of all people diagnosed with HIV, far less, um, we, we kind of forget that women contract HIV, but, but globally, it is still the biggest killer of women between 25 and 49 globally. Between 25 and 49, yes. HIV-related illness kills more women than any other illness. Mm. And Kim, I guess I just your comment on that too in terms of, um, I guess, the agenda around women and girls when it comes to HIV and your experience of that. Yes, well, um, it's it's about getting a dialogue going, really, and, and enabling the voices of women to be heard. Um, they have incredible expertise, women living with HIV themselves, and uh, need to be part of the policy makers and uh, developing the agenda for the future. Um, you know, women, the issues are vast, and we're... Um, with, with the positively fabulous, that's what we're actually articulating, how fabulous women living with HIV are. That's right. And I guess um, internationally we know that, uh, look, 
There's a lot of different issues that inform women and HIV. You touched on some of them before, Susan, around the socioeconomic issues and the patriarchal issues. And I guess what are some of the really core key issues that affect women and HIV globally, Susan? Um, look, I think we seem to forget how closely connected violence against women mm. is because before women contract HIV, women are often subject to violence. Uh, women are often um, subject to having sex that they don't want to have without the contraceptives or the prevention measure measures they want to have. And then when women contract HIV, um, we are all treated as lesser citizens. And if a woman with HIV wants to have a baby, and I've, I've done a study of this in, in six, uh, six countries in Asia, and... Um, treated with great disdain. I mean, how dare you have a child, even though we know today that women um, can take antiretroviral medication that I'm on. I've been on it for 13 years. I have a great immune system. Women can live long and healthy and productive lives. But within that maternal health sector, they're seen as something other than they are coerced into having abortions. They're coerced into being sterilized. Um, they're treated um, w with neglect, but, but when they're delivering, they're lef left last on the list. And um, yeah, uh, and, then, and then if they do happen to, to, to end up as widows, often their property's taken away from them. So women living with HIV have considerably more um, issues related to discrimination than most men living with HIV do. Kim, you've worked um, in quite a few countries, uh, I know you were saying earlier about through Southeast Asia, India, Bangladesh and parts of Africa. Are some of the issues that Susan's talking about here, are they um, issues that are consistent with what you've seen? And also, uh, do you see variances depending on the country and depending on the position of women in that country? Um, I think that the issues across the board are, are fairly similar. They're just more extreme in different different countries um so you know we're we're there's there's a, a surge ahead but women in australia are still dealing with discrimination and stigma as well um it's it's just we we have a bit more autonomy here um whereas when when we're talking about women in developing countries it's a lot harder for them to access uh, treatments and, and and that just comes down to basic economics, you know, as far as air, um, sorry, bus fares, you know, transport to get to clinics, and also the discrimination. So the moment they're walking through the door, it's disclosing their status, uh, which is still a huge issue for many women globally. So I guess in terms of the the different issues that you've seen. Um the availability of services, the availability of support, particularly internationally, are we seeing improvements in that? Are, are we seeing changes and shifts and uh, that are consistent with, I guess, some of the improvements that we're seeing in the treatment of HIV and AIDS more generally? Look, I, I think we've had tremendous success yeah. in, in reducing the, 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 the rates of transmission of HIV mm. from, from parent to child, we, you know, vertical transmission. But in that whole process of like, let's save the babies, I, I do think women have been a little bit forgotten and women's rights have been a little bit forgotten. So women go to the clinic, they get tested, and if they're positive, they do um, experience quite a lot of discrimination that may deter them from coming forward to, to, to uh, go to the clinic during their pregnancy or in a subsequent pregnancy. And in a way, we, yeah, look, we've had great successes in reducing uh, the, the number of paediatric HIV cases. But if we can't look after the mother, then what future does yeah. the, the child have? And so I think we still have to look at the rights of the mothers and, and how they are treated within the maternal health sector. And, and what is your experience of that to this point in terms of what do you think needs to be done to support the rights of the mother more equally, I suppose? Uh, look, there are some amazing programs in um, 
in, in Uganda, in other parts of, of um, Africa, in Fiji, where when you are diagnosed, you then meet another woman living with HIV mm. who has gone through that. So you're not suddenly the leper of society with the, with the incredible negative implications that HIV carries with it. Because regardless of how you contract HIV, you are always then subsequently seen as the other mm. um, or, you know, the person that nobody really wants to get that close to. Um, so you, the woman diagnosed, I mean, and, and I'm talking about pregnancy, not because this is the only way women are diagnosed, but increasingly so since we've got this way to stop medication to stop mother to child transmission of HIV. So women are being diagnosed in which is supposedly a joyous period of their lives. And then they face these enormous obstacles and barriers and challenges and, and shame and, and goodness knows where if they can meet another woman living with HIV, mm. that, that helps that journey so much more. We also need, on the other hand, training of maternal health care staff to understand that whether a woman has HIV or whether she does not have HIV, she has equal rights with any other woman on the planet. Mm. You know, this woman could have, I don't know, hep C or, you know, a whole range of whatever. But HIV should be just treated as a as a chronic condition and not, not be treated with so much fear and, and misunderstanding. Are we doing... Sorry, Kim. No, I was just going to say, basically all the medical services need to be upgraded and brought into line. I mean, I was just speaking to a woman at Federation Square at the World AIDS Day um, gig that was on yesterday, and she was from China and, and a physician from, from there. And I was asking, you know, how many units? And she said that, that she was trained on with HIV. She said there were none and that she just found out that um, HIV was, was an issue. Um, literally in the last couple of months. And uh, her opinion was that it was obviously the responsibility of the, the woman to take care of herself, um, which, you know, is a lack of information. And that's not just saying China. I mean, that's a global issue. We, mm. You know, the limited knowledge that the doctors have and the, the, the lack of, the lack of um, training that they get on HIV itself is is um, appalling and you're working with people in developing countries and they just they're the ones that have to have the knowledge to be able to sort out what's going on also a lot of the time you've only got two lines of medication in developing countries and with this you know a lot of it can't be used because if people have liver problems or whatever they can only use one line and then you know if, if that doesn't work they're back to square one again so there's a lot of issues still that we take for granted here in Australia, but realistically, offshore in developing countries, they're still dealing with basic day-to-day -day human rights, which is, you know, access to health care. Yeah. I, 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 and Kim, I, I, I think this whole thing about blaming w women is very common in developing countries. I mean, even here mm. in Australia. I mean, we had this amazing Neil Blewett in the 80s who, who managed to put in great programs that meant that HIV did not spread rapidly amongst injecting drug users, that there was great education amongst the gay community, and it did not become a generalised epidemic as it has done in many other countries. Um, but in many countries, I mean, even here... Um, I think nearly every HIV positive woman is asked in the last 12 months by some medical professional, oh, how did you get it? You know, and the fact mm. is that, you know, 90% of women on the planet contract HIV the same way that your mum and dad got you. You know, that they got it through sex, through unprotected sex, usually with a partner they trusted, usually somebody to whom they might be married to or whatever. I'm not judging that at all. Women also get it through sex work or drug use. But if a woman is a drug user, she is ju judged so much more harshly mm. than a man. A man's allowed to play around. He's allowed to go to the sex workers. But a woman who, you know, who engages in that. So what we have is this whole culture that women with HIV have done something wrong, which is very sad. 
And you end up in parts of Africa where grandparents are looking after gra uh, uh, their, their grandchildren and they're resentful and they're now giving messages to their children, you be careful or you'll grow up like your parents. Mm. You know, so it's like this judge... That, if there was no discrimination, if there was no judgment around HIV, if it was treated as a, a chronic medical d condition like diabetes, um, we'd all just be getting on with it. It's only the stigma and discrimination that stops us moving forward on that. And that's because a lot of people have a very hard time about talking about orifices. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, well put. Not at Joy 94.9, no. <laughs> um, on that discrimination and stigma, I mean, uh, are we leading the way in turning <coughs> turning the tide on that in Australia? What is, what is the experience for women with HIV and AIDS in Australia? Are we doing it right or is it still evolving or how is it placed in terms of the global context? Oh, I think it's a, a shifting um, landscape. I certainly think that 20 odd years ago when I was diagnosed, um, I was a freak um, and, and medical practitioners did shun me and I was refused treatment and I did, uh, I, I was refused treatment when I was in a, a, a critical, uh, not critical, but um, um, I'd been in an accident. Um, I think it has changed, um, but I still think that women living with HIV, it's still got this like kind of oh my goodness, in Australia, it's like, how could you have HIV? Isn't that a gay disease? The rest of the world, they realise that HIV affects everybody. We've had great success stories, and so women living with HIV are still a minority within a, a minority. Mm, mm. Your comments, Kim? Uh, yeah, I think um, that basically in Australia, if you know where to or how to access the appropriate treatment and support, care and support then it is available. But a lot of the time, when someone's just going to their GP and they've, they've not got the inside of how to access, that's, that's quite a hard call for women to be able to, to sort of find the appropriate support that's required. Also, you know, um, there, there is a serious need for support because a lot of the people that work in the sector are HIV positive. Mm. So there, there's a lot of deference that's there as well. So, so there's, there's care and support required for them as well, which is an, another issue that we're not just talking about within Australia as well. Um, I, I think that it, it's quite important that we, we make, make it a, a statement that, that women are responsible for caring for their children, caring for their families, um, nurturing a, as a whole and a lot of the time we can fall into that trap where we don't spend enough time caring for ourselves and also it's quite hard to ask for help so th that that's a global issue that mm. happens with women with HIV I've just been doing a documentary around the world and I've done some interviews with uh, about seven women in the last couple of weeks in Bangkok and all of them were like um, doing in the most incredible work uh, but when you asked how they were supporting themselves there wasn't an answer you know and, and that I sort of find that that's sort of a missing key that's within this sector. I, I think that's true Kim th this whole economic uh, disability of women and the fact that I mean it, money even stops them going to the clinic per se mm. never mind anything beyond that Yes, indeed. Okay, you are on Joy 94.9 listening to the World AIDS Day Worldwide Broadcast and I am very happy to be talking about the issue of women girl and girls this evening with Susan Paxton and also Kim Davis. We would love you to join our global conversation tonight through the hashtag JoyWAD on Twitter or you can email us directly at onair, sorry, onair at joy.org.au. You can, of course, watch the live stream in the studio here at worldaidsdayworldwide.org. We're gonna, we will be back with your comments and questions. We'd welcome any questions that you have and we will also look at your comments then too. And I'll also be ha having a chat to Susan and Kim about some of their personal experiences of HIV and AIDS. We'll be back shortly. Thank you. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. 
You are on Joy 94.9 World AIDS Day Worldwide Broadcast and we are talking stepping up the cure this evening, when, in particular women and girls. And I have in the studio with me Susan Paxton and Kim Davis. Now, uh, Susan and Kim, I wanted to have a chat to you if I could about some of your, I guess, your personal experiences of living with HIV. Um, you've both been living with HIV for t- over 20 years, I think. And so, Susan, if I can start with you just a little bit, I suppose, about your experiences of being, um, I know you touched on a little bit earlier, but um, just your experiences of being diagnosed and um, and what the initial impact was like for you. Oh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a terrible cold. I don't <laughs> don't normally quite sound so sexy if anyone's <laughs> listening to me on the other side of the globe. Um, look, being, di- <clears throat> being diagnosed... Um, in my early 30s or mid 30s, I was. Um, I, I, I was a, a mother of a two year old boy. Um, I was a single parent. And to be honest, in those days, it was the most shattering news I could ever have faced. Um, nothing could have been worse except the health of my son. Mm. You know, bad news about him. I, I was being told that I wasn't going to see him finish primary school. Um, somehow something inside me went, no, I will, I will. But my logic self was saying, no, you won't, you won't. And as I became more and more actively involved in HIV, I mean, I, I was a sort of an old feminist from way back and I've spent a lot of time in Africa before this. Um, so I knew where to put my energies. Um, but it was almost like against the odds. And um, so for me... The early days were really, really difficult. I mean, World AIDS Day to me, um, and you might hear the lump in my throat, I've lost over 100 colleagues and Mm. friends, lovers and and family because of HIV. Um, So for me, it's a time to remember the time before there was HIV drugs. In 1999... I was a woman that could barely walk 200 metres. My hair was falling out. My face was falling off. My coronary artery was in spasm several times a day. And at the end of 99, I took antiretroviral drugs. And they were the most um, life-giving... I mean, I I wrote a song to my toxic drugs. You know, I was so (laughs) anti-HIV drugs. But they they brought me back... Um, I began to live with HIV before I was really sort of dying with HIV. Six months later, I was running with the Olympic torch, you know, for the Sydney 2000 um, torch run. So for me, there's like before this millennium and the millennium we now face. So before we face death, we've had so much grief that is almost unsurmountable. And now we've got hope, but we still only have half the world who needs the antiretroviral drugs that are keeping me alive. We only have half the people who need them that are on it. And we have enormous problems with access to the drugs, um, sustainable supplies of drugs, issues around stockouts, the fact that nobody in the Pacific, unless you're living in Kiribati, from PNG to to Fiji to, 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 to Samoa, can get a viral load test that tells you how your virus is responding to the medication. So we still have challenges ahead, Mm. even though we have drugs to keep many of us alive and we're going to live long and healthy lives and we're not going to infect others. Mm. Kim, can I ask you the same question really about that? Um, I I think it's 20 years ago for you uh, next year, is that right? Yeah, that's right, next year. Um, Next year, the 20th AIDS conference here in Melbourne, and also I'm 20 years positive, plus I turned 60, so um, it's a big year. <laughs> it's a big year. It's a very big year. And that in, that initial, I suppose, that impact for you um, 20 years ago and, and, and probably similar, I guess, uh, a similar s- s- social environment to what Susan's talking about um, at the time of your diagnosis. Can you share a little with us about that? Um, well, when when I was first diagnosed, I actually used to smoke back then. Shame on me. Um, but I, I, when I got diagnosed, I spoke to the doctor who gave me the results and said, well, you know, should I stop smoking? And his response was, don't bother. <laughs> but, you know, basically you've got six months or whatever. It's 
don't waste your time with the stress of giving up smoking. Seems I have, so that's good. Um, <laughs> and I'm still here. Um, <laughs> um, you know, things like uh, opening the... Fr- I have two children as well, and um, our front door having blood smeared on the front of it. Cool. Um, you know, crazy... Um, unnecessary things that was per- perpetuated with fear campaigns that went on, which, I, you know, also part of it was the Grim Reaper mm. scenario that, that happened back then as well. Um, and also just, just lack of information with, with the general public, their lack of, of understanding and, and such a fear factor. Now there's, there's, you know, in Australia, there's a bit of um, people are fairly blasé in in a way, which is why we've got an increase in our figures in HIV in in the recent year. Um, but offshore, you know, we can talk that things have got much better here, and we have access to X, Y, and Z. But realistically, there's people that are, are you know, our neighbours in Southeast Asia, the Pacific, like Susan said, um, they don't have access. You know, you, you, your viral load again, you can't get tested with that. Your, your children, how do you get medication for them? You know, up until last year, they were still breaking tablets up, trying to get them, them right for the children. Um, so so things, things are still sort of need a lot of work and a lot of compassion and and people the the broader public need more information they need to be responsible for themselves it's not about people living with hiv being the ones that have to protect other people people need the information so that they can can make sure that they have choices and they can they can protect themselves from from getting infected and, and that's a global thing. And yes, we're on it. You know, it, it is happening. But, you know, there is half of the world that are not on antiretroviral, mm. fears, you know, the, the um, HIV drugs. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the big issues we face at the moment is that funding for HIV is about to go down. It's already been going down since a year after the global financial crisis. In Australia... Um, We know that the current government has said they're going to uh, decrease foreign aid by four and a half billion. They've over the next, was it five years? I can't remember. Um, They've already disbanded AusAid. They're going to to move their focus from health and poverty towards, you know, what's best for the investments of Australia. And and I'm worried that, that, you know, we are at quite a critical stage. We have the drugs to make people have um, a negligible viral load so that they cannot infect other people. But at the same time, here in Australia, embarrassingly for Australia, we suddenly have a 20% increase on the domestic front. You know, everyone thinks Australia is the big, you know, they've got everything right. And suddenly it's like, uh uh-oh, you know, last year we had 1,200, the year before there was 1,000. You know, people saying, is it a blip? I don't know. Maybe it's about increased use of ice. I don't know how you, you address that. I think that's a, a real issue that hasn't been addressed within the HIV sector. You know, we've, we've, we've addressed injecting drug use. Mm. We never addressed the issues for partners of injecting drug use. But it's not injecting drug use now. It's drug use where the drug use itself is not harmful to others. It's just that you're off your face when you're using the drugs mm. and you have you lose the sense of responsibility. So we, we're entering really different territory. We have medication to <clears throat> keep those of us who have contracted HIV live long, healthy lives, and yet there are other social factors that are coming in that, that you know, whether it be the, the funding issues or the recreational drug u- issues... It just means the landscape's constantly changing. Mm. I think I think there's also a, a lot of a political, um, you know, where different groups uh, that that 
they're fighting for the dollar as well. And and so therefore it's sort of it becomes quite disturbing on, on that basis. I mean there's always an argument that the numbers of women in Australia aren't that high, um, and henceforth, you know, there's, there's not that that much need. But, you know, the response to that is let's keep it that way. Mm. And, mm. you know, the virus knows no borders. So it's, it's, we have got people travelling in and out of our country continuously, you know. Um, we, you know, people who, you know, there are people that are not monogamous. Um, the reality is that we need to, to keep on top of it. And there needs to be programs that are specifically um, relating to women's issues and, and women, the way they deal with it and the way they handle the drugs, different things like that. All of that, I mean, both Susan and I have talked about. Mm. And also the way that, you know... I hate to say it, guys, but, you know, we've got wombs and vaginas and we, we can get pregnant and we bleed and uh, there's all these kind of ucky things that you have to think about when, you, when it's with women. But it's a fact, you know, and so we have to look at it. Amongst HIV-positive women in Asia, the only contraception that is ever promoted for them is condom. Mm. For a heterosexual woman who's HIV-positive, why would she have a greater ability to use a condom than a, a woman who's HIV-negative? So they're looking at, oh, this woman can't, you know, we can't let her spread the disease. I'm sorry, this woman's quite unlikely to spread HIV. But if you don't give her other options and make her realise that there are female condoms and oral contraceptives, she's going to have unwanted pregnancies and mm. being, be treated like, like a nobody again. We've had a question come in through um, through our through our email from Lenny, who basically says, "What about the family unit? Women are mothers, and most often the family leader. They bind the family together. How significant is the impact on the family with a mother contract uh, contracts HIV?" Well, if that mother has access to good services, there should be no uh, long term impact. If that mother has the information to know that she can go and when her immune system needs it, like when her immune system is less than 500 CD4 cell counts per whatever microliter, and she goes on the drugs that I'm on that will only cost her government, and the government will pay $80 a year, that woman can live a long, healthy, fruitful life. My son has known I've, I've got HIV since he was about three years old. Mm. It has not impacted on his life. Um, I'm grateful that I went on drugs and he still has a mum. Mm. Um, so it should not have it should not have long term so consequences in this day and age. Of course, if that woman's living in a village that's, you know, two mountains away from the nearest yeah. clinic, then we're facing all sorts of problems. Kim, do you have any, any comments on that particular question? Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I, I think that it, it, it's got a huge impact on on women and their families. I think that that the woman has a tendency to be the nurturer, so mm. she has a tendency to be the one that feels responsible to make sure everyone else is okay in the family to support them. And um, there's outside of that, it's, especially in developed countries, there's not such a unification of women's support as such. Whereas in developing countries, the women have got a greater network of supporting each other. That doesn't mean I'm not negating the fact that the discrimination and stigma and violence against women with HIV is just a huge. I mean, it's monumental. Actually, Kim, I think they might have the networks, but do they have the power to actually assert their rights or, or claim their rights? I, I, I think that's really, you know, not the case in m many, many countries. I, I didn't mean asserting their rights what i meant was they actually had support within women's groups as such um but as as far as changing policies and and breaking down the barriers and being able to um have a dialogue with their their physicians or with even the fact that a lot of people in southeast asia well in indonesia specifically they 
they are diagnosed by outreach workers, so they go and get their, their blood tested and then the results are given to the outreach worker and they'll actually be doing that on the street with people. Yeah, but, but I do think there's a real huge gap. I think women in Asia are perhaps the most conservative. They're the ones that in the world that at least want to go to a, a, a male doctor. This would be more so than, say, in Africa. I'm t- yes, definitely. And I've, I've lived in, mm. in both continents. But um, I, I'm not saying that patriarchal oppression is any greater in, in Asia than in Africa. Yeah. But African women, um, they can swing a punch if they need to, some of them. Um, Asian women would be much less likely to. Um, and so you have women that are terrified to go to doctors. So, for example... One in four cases of cervical cancer in the world are in India. Indian women don't want to go to the doctor to have a pap smear. Now, if you're a woman with HIV, you are twice more likely mm. to, 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 to experience cervical cancer than a woman who is not HIV negative. This is the kind of issue that is not there, that there's not, not a great awareness of. And we have more women living with HIV in India, per se, I believe than in any other country in the world. It's 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 amongst the top top twenty. I mean, it's not the, the the percentage of the population with HIV is not high, but because it's over a billion people, mm. there's a lot of women in India with HIV, and, and and that's just one example of where women's issues are very specific. Cervical cancer is a killer. A lot of women in India are dying of cervical cancer, and the awareness of Pap smears doesn't exist because it's shyness, this cultural. Um, embarrassment about talking to or showing your bodies to male doctors. Hmm. Yep, and back to medical services with better training. <laughs> Coming back to um, to Australia for a moment, just, um, Susan, you were talking in the break about some of the dynamic women that are living with HIV and doing great work in this space. We've got a, a few minutes left of our conversation. Obviously, you two are two examples of that. Are there any other stories you have about the work that is happening uh, we amongst women who are living with HIV, either in Australia or internationally, and, and how that's starting, I, I guess, a process of really empowering women to take a lead role in this process and to start to challenge the agenda and challenge the research and challenge the services and, and thereby change the experience for women with HIV and AIDS. I mean, I've, absolutely. There are many uh, great role models in Australia. I know Deanna Blegg, uh, um, she's, um, like, she's a triathlon mega athlete that kind of (laughs) she's like in her 40s and becomes third in the world in the mudders the the, i don't know something mudders mudders. she's yes exactly (laughs) tough mudders she's totally nuts love it to bits um we have many great role models and in asia it's been slow to evolve um but eventually it started to happen that you have women that are really speaking out i i um I, I wrote the stories of, of 10 women and one girl living with HIV in Asia and the Pacific. I called it diamonds. In a past life, I had a geology degree. And I think this is the best use of my geology degree. <laughs> I called it diamonds because they are formed under incredible pressure to become the toughest, most brilliant and beautiful um, uh, stones on the planet. <laughs> and and there are diamonds out there who are doing really a great work. We've Next year at the International AIDS Conference, um, we're going to have a, an incredible lineup of, of HIV positive women. We're going to open the conference from the community with IU, a young woman from uh, nearest neighbour, uh, well, next to nearest neighbour, Indonesia, the world's most populous Muslim country. She will open the conference. Behind her will be 30 people in traditional dress from Nepal and Bhutan and Pakistan right across to Fiji. PNG, showing the breadth and diversity of our region. We'll have day, day one of the conference, Lydia Mungahera, who is a doctor working at the coalface in Uganda, living with HIV. Day two, Jennifer Gatsy, who's talking about gender inequality and uh, is uh, part of the group that are fighting the Namibian government about forced sterilisation of women. We have an HIV-positive sex worker. We have a, a woman on on the last plenary before the closing who has been born was born with HIV uh, from Puerto Rico. Lorangelis uh, Thomas Negro, who does a blog called Ovaries of Steel, and on the <laughs> final day, um, a positive young gay male from Australia will pass on the community 
banner to Violet Banda from uh, Malawi, who was also born with HIV. Thank you so much for that. And, and Kim, um, we've got a couple of minutes left, but I just wondered if you could share your, I guess, a couple of your own stories about women who are doing amazing work to empower women in, in the issue of HIV and AIDS. Yeah, well, I mean, um, in 1994, I was first working with someone in Indonesia, a woman called Susanna Murney, and she um, was the first openly positive woman in Indonesia where people were still being killed if they diagnosis was if they people knew that they were HIV positive um, working with other people in Thailand or both of these women have passed away because they didn't have the medication but they were pioneers and they were out there and they were, were doing incredible work and now today we've got we've got women in Cambodia Vietnam I mean the whole of Southeast Asia are actually articulating issues, concerns, really working. Another lady that is in um, in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, um, Norella, she's, she's opened up a house to 16 uh, women living with HIV mm. and their children and is just supporting them out of her own pocket. Um, just incredible people. Uh, we're, we're, we're working with, with women that are passionate that what has happened to them will not happen to another woman. Mm. And, and that, that's their energy that they go forth with. Um, other, other women from India, transgenders, they're, they're, they're doing incredible work. They, they've, they've now have a, a place, of, whereas before it was really hard for them to have a position within the sector. Um, and they're doing great work. So there, there's a lot, a lot of women out there that are doing incredible things, working with women and also the general public and, and, and the people living with HIV. Um, Burma is now opened up. It, it's working. Things are happening there that are, it's working really well. And it's it sort of started to... Like, I've just come back from ICAP in Bangkok, which was last week, and and just the amount of Burmese people that were there that were active and, and, and mm. doing, it, it, things it's, are moving. So I, there's I, a lot of inspiration amongst the, the changes that are happening for, for women and girls in, in HIV and AIDS, and I, I want to thank you both so much for joining me to have this conversation this evening, a really important conversation to have, and of course, thank you for the work that you're both doing in the same space. Um, it has been, you have been listening to Joy 94.9 World AIDS Day Worldwide Broadcast. Coming up next is Where Are We Headed? Indigenous Australia with Brian Andy. I'm Katie Larson, and uh, thank you. Join us for more on Joy 94.9 going right through to 6am with this special broadcast. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you.